We'll wait a few more minutes past seven, then we'll start. We'll wait a few more minutes. I don't want to be interrupted. <laughs> huh? Uh, George. This is right here. I, I, I can raise the roof if you want. Uh, yeah, well, it's, I've got the, uh, I'm wired up. Oh, yeah, my charge. <laughs> okay, up. Okay, there go the doors. All righty. Hey, wasn't this a great show? Goodbye. <laughs> I want to start with a little, uh, a little saying. This session is for the beloved senior citizens who have reached an age that these jokes now have real meaning. We have all achieved the aches and pains as well as the wisdom of growing old, older. So let us, let us have no groans or moans, laugh loud and hearty. It's good for you. <laughs> All right, let me, let me start off. I have a list of, of people who are telling me jokes, so I'll start it off first with one or two jokes. All right. Three sisters were in their home. One was in 94, one was 92, and one was 90. The other, lady, the other one was upstairs on the top floor. She yells downstairs. I turn on the bathtub and I can't remember. Am I supposed to take a bath or did I have my bath? The 92-year-old the one says, uh, I'm on the second floor. Did I walk up or was I going down? The young one, she they're calling down to her, will you please come help your sisters? She's about 90 years old. So she says, oh, oh these, these sisters of mine. And she goes, knock on wood, I'm not like that. One of the sisters calls down, well, will you come and help? And the young, the young, young, young one calls up, she says, I'll come up and take care of you as soon as I answer the back door. Somebody's knocking. <laughs> you don't get it. <laughs> Excuse me, I'll explain it to me. <laughs> uh, four women are sitting around playing cards, and they, they're talking about their families. One lady, she's sitting there, she's got a beautiful fur coat on. She says, see this fur coat? It's not one of, I have quite a few at home, and my son bought it for me. That's nice. The second lady, she says, see that beautiful car outside? My son bought that one for me. And the other lady says, this house that you're sitting in, my son bought that one for me. The fourth one goes, huh? My son goes to the psychiatrist three times a week, and he only talks about me. <laughs> I got to laugh at my own jokes. <laughs> All right, first one I'm going to call on, Alice. Is Alice here? Alice isn't here yet. All right, John, you got a joke? 
ครับดิจอร์จเคยบอกคุณเรื่องการทำงานนั่นคือเรื่องที่น่าสนใจมากเลยคุณรู้ไหมว่าเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหมเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหมเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหมเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหมเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหมเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหมเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหมเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหมเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหมเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหมเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหมเขาเป็นนักเรียนที่ใช่ไหม But then he came across this want ad, which said, "Want a young man who is agile and short." And he said, and said "Well, that might mean me." And he looked again at the want ad. It was from the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. <laughs> so he he went. He knew that place quite well. So uh, he went there and asked to see the manager. And they took him into the manager's office. And the, he, the manager closed the door, and very almost hardly above a whisper, told him about the situation they had. Their pet, their prize, uh, chimpanzee died, and the children come every every Saturday morning to to watch the chimpanzee, and uh, they, they just love it and. And so, what he wanted to get someone who would put on a chimpanzee suit, <laughs> and and perform for the children. And George said, "Well, that that's isn't hard to do." And um, so he he took the job, and they paid him, and he he uh, had a great time. He had all of these these the equipment, the the ladders, the swings, the ropes to climb. Uh, he he was having a great time in the chimpanzee cage. And the kids did; they didn't know any different. So there, he he kept coming to the uh, to to the zoo, and after a week, said, "You know, I know it's not easy to get a good trained chimpanzee. I'll just I'll do this as long as you need to find one." And so he just had a great time, and uh, he had such a great time that the equipment was starting to wear out. <laughs> It never had such a workout before, and so there he was. And one day he was taking a great big leap on the on the rope, and it broke. And he sailed right out of the chimpanzee cage, into the lion's cage. <laughs> and he forgot who he was. And he started yelling, "Help! Help!" And the lion looked at him and said, "Shut up, or we'll both get fired." <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't remember seeing you from the cage. I'm trying to think, but okay. <laughs> Alice, you showed up. You're next. So, everybody knows Tom Burns. He lives here. He was up on the square, and he uh, saw two farmers. So he just stopped to see what they were talking about. And one farmer looked at the other, and he said, "Ole, what happened to you? I never saw you look this bad." Ole said, "I got a big problem. Got to put my number one bull down." For this past year, I've been feeding that big bull, and it's too expensive. I can't keep him; he's not working. Got to put him down. And Tom Burns looked at the other guy. What is he going to say? The other guy said, "Hey, before you do that, check on that new vet. He's down off the square, around Pinckney Street. He's got the state-of-the-art stuff. He knows exactly what to do." He's got some medicine that'll fix that bull up. He'll forget about the dandelions. He'll be dancing with the cows. So the other guy said, "Well, okay, I'll try anything, because I can't afford to feed him anymore. What should I ask for?" And Tom Burns said he heard the other fellow say, 
ask for the stuff that tastes like peppermint. <laughs> Okay. Uh, hey, this happened one night, about oh, two, three o'clock in the morning, in a residential street. Uh, there's a knock on the door of this home. Oh, all right. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, and there, two, three o'clock in the morning, and this young fella is knocking on the door. Wake, wakes up the people in the house. The man comes downstairs, opens the door, and the young fellow says, I need a push. And the man in the house says, it's 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Can't you come back later? It, it's, it's, so, it, it's just too early in the morning to help you out. Slams the door on him. Goes upstairs. And the fellow's still banging on the door. I need a push. I need a push. So the, the wife is telling the, fellow, the husband, you remember last year you were in the same situation. You needed some help with your car. And your neighbors came down and helped. So the husband says, OK, all right. He gets dressed, comes downstairs, and there's no, nobody at the front door. He opens the door and he says, young man, where are you? Where are you? He says, you needed a push. The fellow on the side, he says, yeah, I need a push. I'm on your porch swing. (laughs) 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 Um, This, um, a a lady comes running into the veterinarian's uh, office. She's carrying a duck. And she says, Doctor, doctor, I think something's wrong with my duck. It's just not moving. I think maybe she's gone. So the doctor says, OK, come on in. Puts it down on the table. And he's getting a test, not moving around at all. And, she, and the lady says, please, you got to do something. Try it. So gives it some shots or whatever. Still not moving. Please, please, try. So he says, okay, just a minute. He goes out, he comes back with a Labrador. The dog sniffs around, isn't moving. Oh, gosh, gosh. She still insists, come on, let's, let's. So he says, okay, one more. He comes, brings down, brings in the house cat. Cat walks around, sniffs. No. So the sorry man, just take your dog and do what you can with it. So it says, in the meantime, go in the front office. I'll give you I'll give you the bill. <laughs> he he gives her the bill and she goes, Oh my God! Twenty-five dollars? for the visit and fifteen hundred dollars for the exams? What what he says first of all, he had lab tests and the second he she he had a cat scan. <laughs> okay. Uh this hat um a, um, a, a, a an old time farmer who has been in the city for a long, long, for quite a few years. He comes to the city with his wife and son. They go into a department store, looking around, and he comes to where the elevators are at, and he's standing and he's looking, and, and he sees the uh, the indicator going up and back down. Then while he's there, when the elevator's down, uh, a elderly lady walks into the elevator, gets in the elevator, and he's watching the the elevator go up, pauses, then comes down, 
and a beautiful young lady comes walking out of the elevator. The farmer looks down at his son and he says, go get your mother. <laughs> okay. okay, Hank, you got something. Okay, okay. You mean I'm gonna go over time? You got two jokes. Okay. <laughs> two men are walking along a path, and one of them stops and says, Oh my goodness, look at that. My wife and my mistress are talking together. What am I gonna do? And the other man says, Oh, I was just gonna ask the same question. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> okay, the <Good> next. <night. laughs> oh, you can't think of that one? Maybe it'll come to you. You'll raise your hand. <laughs> okay, okay. Joe, you got it, Joe. Here. I like, I like to tell true stories. This actually happened. When Groucho was in his 80s, as many of us are, uh, this woman he was shacked up with sent him on a, Aaron Fleming, sent, it, sent him on a tour to make money. At a Midwest college, I think it was Iowa State, a perk young Cohen asked him if he believed in the existence of a god. And he answered, well, that's a very pertinent question. And I've been giving it a lot of thought lately. You know, I'm a lot older than you are, and in all likelihood, I'm gonna find out a lot sooner. And when I do, I'll try and drop you a line. <laughs> or, or maybe I'll have to push up a note. We're better off with Groucho. Uh, <laughs> Okay, another, another true, true, true story. When Cardinal Cushing was a parish priest in New York, he witnessed a horrible accident. There's a guy with the tire marks right over his chest. He's, he's, he's lying on his thing. The Cardinal goes over to him gets out his vestments, put on, puts on his vestments, get out his missile. Do you believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Why, I'm dying, and you're making with the riddles. <laughs> you got another one? Well, I had another one, but I... I had another one, but I forgot it. You know. That's the best <laughs> <joke. Hey>. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good well, what's, joke. What's my other one, Gene? Gene will tell me what it is. May I have my instrument? Thank you. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, oh, I, um, this, uh, this uh, old man in shabby clothes. He, he goes uh, to his place of worship and he's praying to God, God, please, please help me win the lottery. Please, I'd love, I'd love to win the lottery. He, he, he goes on like this for all, quite a while. Please, God, please, God, help me win the lottery. And after a week or so, there's a big flash, boom! God answers, Louis, what can I do for you? God, please help me win the lottery. God thinks for a few moments and he says, I would be very happy to help you, but you first have to buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Is that a good one? Okay. <laughs> okay. There's a man um, walking down the street, and he's got a mule in there. And they walk a little bit, and the mule stumbles. So the guy says, that's one. And they walk a little further, and the mule stumbles again. He says, that's two. And then he works a little bit further. He says, that's three. He takes out a shotgun and shoots him dead. And the wife says, my God, what did you do? You killed a poor animal. And he looks at her and says, that's one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Huh? You, you you remember the joke? Hurry up, hurry up before you forget it. Hurry up. <laughs> the priest, the minister, and the rabbi are discussing when life begins. The priest says life begins at conception. That's when the divine spark is transferred. The minister says, under modern knowledge and interpretation, life begins at the quickening. That's when the fetus takes on human form. The rabbi says, boys, you're both wrong. Life begins when the kids leave for college and the dog dies. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Five, you got one? Two, three, I was <laughs> well, This concerns a very elderly gentleman living in an apartment house, and every sunny day he would very slowly and with a great deal of effort bring his chair outside, put it in the sun, sit down, and, you know, nap in the sun, then one sunny day he wasn't there. The next day it was beautiful, sunny, and he wasn't there. After a couple of weeks, the other people assumed he had passed on. And a year later, he came back. They said, where were you? He says, I was in jail. They said, in jail? What were you in jail for? Well, I was sitting here minding my own business. Around the corner comes a cop with this beautiful young 17-year-old model. She says, he's the one. He seduced me, and now I'm carrying his child. So they look at this feeble old man saying, you mean a judge and jury believed you? Believed her? Of course not. I was so flattered, I pleaded guilty. <laughs> okay. 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 A little a little change. I'll read you some one-liners. Um, when chemists die, they bury them. Those who took chemistry should know that one. <laughs> oh, I got a microphone. Here. <laughs> hey, jokes about German sausage are the worst. Ooh. I know a guy who's addicted to brake fluid. He says he can stop any time. Oh, yeah. How does Moses make his tea? He brews it. Think about that for a second. That was, yeah, no. This was a shorter version. <laughs> uh, I stayed up all night to see where the sun went. Then it dawned on me. Who, who? Oh, that was <laughs> Ruth Sosis. <laughs> uh, I'm reading a book about anti-gravity. I can't put it down. <laughs> I did a theatrical performance about puns. It was a play on words. <laughs> Class trip to the Coca-Cola factory. I hope there's no pop quiz. Hey. 
I didn't like my beard at first, then it grew on me. How, how do you make holy water? Boil the hell out of it. <laughs> Are these getting better or worse? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear about the cross-eyed teacher who lost her job because she couldn't control her pupils? Oh, when you get a, when you go, when you get, <laughs> when you get a bladder infection, you're in trouble. Ooh. When does a clog? What does a clog do when it's hungry? It goes back four seconds. I'm getting near the end. <laughs> I wondered why the baseball was getting bigger. Then it hit me. <laughs> Broken pencils are pointless. I try to catch some fog. I missed. Come on, come on. <laughs> England has no kidney bank, but it does have a liver pool. I, I used to be a banker, but then I lost interest. I dropped out of communism class because of lousy marks. <laughs> I got a job at a bakery because I needed dough. Haunted French pan haunted French pancakes give me the creeps. <laughs> well, I, I got <laughs> Velcro. What a ripoff. <laughs> Ven venison for dinner. Oh dear. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> okay. I'm with this. What am I doing? A man and wife are getting ready for bed, and he's looking all over. He's, he's tapping the bed. He's feeling the bed, and he's starting to touch his wife. And the wife says, "Oh, you want you want to get romantic?" And he says, "No, darling, I'm looking for the remote." <laughs> oh, here's, oh, you got another one. Lars and Oli went fishing, and they went first class. They hired a guide and everything. They got back. It cost them $500, and they had caught five fish. Lars says, boy, Oli, five fish, $500. Yah, we're lucky we didn't catch more fish. <laughs> Okay, Marge, Marge Engelman. This is a story about George too. Boy, am I popular. <laughs> this is from a book called Whole Brain Workouts, and there's a chapter in it called Laughter is good for the brain. So that's what you're all about. There was a couple, George and Lillian, and they uh, had both lost their spouses, and they were lonely, and they began seeing each other. They went to the movies sometimes, and they went for rides in the country. And then one evening, when George was over at Lillian's home, um, he thought, oh, we're getting along so good. Why don't I just ask her to marry me? So he did. And Lillian said, yes, she would marry him. But on the way home, 
he couldn't. He got all upset because he couldn't remember if she had said yes or no. <laughs> so he was really upset. He didn't hardly sleep at all that night. But he got up early the next morning, and he called her, and he said, Lillian, I'm so sorry. I can't remember if you said yes or no. And there was a long silence. And she said, oh, I'm so glad you called. I couldn't remember who asked me. <laughs> hey, uh, this happened. Uh, this happened in a synagogue this one day. A little boy, about seven, eight years old, was walking down the corridor with the rabbi, and it's the corridor. Somebody like doesn't like a joke already. Uh, in a minute, I hope. I hope. Mike is getting so excited. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the, the, they were walking down the corridor, and this corridor on either side had memorial plaques memorializing people, uh, children who have passed away over the years. And it comes to this one wall, and he, the rabbi tells the little boy, "This is the this is the wall where we honor." Uh, our sir, our sir, our people who died in the service. They walk away, and all of a sudden, the little boy stops and looks at the rabbi. Did they die in the Friday night service or the Saturday morning service? <laughs> <laughs> a real quickie: a oil company found oil on a farmer's uh, land. So the farmer took an oily retirement. <laughs> well, well, you got another one. You want to keep this on you? <laughs> Why are churches and synagogues so full of old people? Why? They're cramming for their final exam. <laughs> Sai, you got another one? <laughs> yeah, no, okay. uh, this is about uh, old friends of mine, Oli and Lena. They were at an elk's picnic. The food was wonderful, and they had quite a few drinks, and Oli started to get a little amorous. So he said, Lena, he said, I got my truck up there on the hill. We could go inside. Nobody could see what we're doing. So she was feeling the same way, so they went up there and opened the door. She looked inside. She said, oh, I can't go in here. It's got grease and dirt in it. It's all right. We'll go under the truck. So they did. And uh, sometime later, still having a wonderful time, they hear his friend Sven coming up the hill. Orly, what you doing there? So Oli thought quick, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm checking the tires. So she said, also uh, Sven said, well, while you're doing that, you better have a look at the brakes. The truck rolled down the hill 10 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, you got another one? It's about a beautiful woman, had a problem. She had a rash, just terrible. Doctors looked at it, couldn't help her. Finally, one doctor said, you know, Cleopatra had beautiful skin, and she credited milk baths. Why don't you try that? This woman said, that's a lot of milk. That would be a lot of money. He said, go out to a farmer, make a deal with him. 25 gallons, that shouldn't cost that much. 
So she's talking to the farmer. The farmer's going on. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, does this milk have to be pasteurized? She said, no, just up to my armpits. <laughs> This happened in a senior citizen home. A new resident was brought into the into the recreation hall where everybody sitting around talking. This gentleman was brought in, and um, this woman comes up to him. She says, "Well, I like to meet the, the new people that come in and uh, find out about you." So. What's your name? Well, my name is Henry. Fine. Nice meeting you, Henry. And uh, and uh, may we have some uh, of your history? He says, "Well, I had I had three wives." And oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. The lady says, "And and what's with the, with them?" He says, "Well, they're all dead." Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. She says, well, what was the cause? Well, he says, the first one, I, dr I, I drowned her in the bathtub. The second, well, I ran her over a cliff. And the third one, what, is, let's see, what did I do with the third one? I, uh, I shot her. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, gee. And the woman stops, pauses, and she yells to the woman, Ladies, he's single! <laughs> oh, this, uh, another, this man came to the, to the house of uh, prayers. He, he was real shabby, and, uh, and you know how it is sometimes, the, the usher at the front door Licks you over, Sullivan. He may not let you in. So this man is pleading, please, please let me in. I, I, I just have to let my soul out in, in front of the altar. Okay, all right. So the man is going in, and as he's walking down, the usher yells to him. He says, "You can go in, but don't let me catch you praying." This uh, this man comes into a um, into a restaurant, sits down, orders orders a bowl of soup. He gets the bowl of the soup, sits there. He's looking at it, and he says, "Waiter, come here." Points to the soup. The waiter says. Uh, uh, Something wrong with the soup? He says, what? Is it too hot? Hmm. Too cold? Hmm. Uh, is there a fly in the soup? Well, the fly's got to eat also. No. Um, is it, uh, is it too much salt? Hmm. Too much sugar? Hmm. No, I, I eat it. So the, the, uh, so the waiter says, here, let me sit down and, and have the soup. The waiter sits down. The waiter looks at the customer. He says, you don't have a spoon. The, guy, the man says, no. <laughs> oh, a, uh, oh, a friend. You said you got a joke. Me? Yeah, you said early you, you got a joke. Huh? Sure. Sure. Oh, I can't move. I'm stuck. Sorry. <laughs> well, this guy was sitting <clears throat> in his car. He opens the window and he sees a frog right on the on the pavement. 
And the frog says, take me home, take me home. So he picked up the frog and put the frog next to him on the front seat. He comes home and takes the frog, put the frog on his bed. And lo and behold, the frog turns into a beautiful young lady. And right at moment, his wife comes in. And he tells her the story, but she did not believe him. So end of story. And of course you know that Norwegian with his eyes hot, he, dr he, he drowned Lake Mendota. He wanted to have a basement. So second joke. The third joke <laughs> was already told <laughs> by somebody else. I finished with the definition of a marriage. That's a young, beautiful couple in bed. And there they go. One wants the window open, and the other one wants the window closed. That's the definition of a marriage. That sounds familiar, eh? <laughs> Okay, so, so, uh, Sylvia, yeah, Sylvia has a joke. Is that his brother or son? <laughs> I read this about 1945 in the Reader's Digest. <laughs> There's a Sunday school class, and the teacher asks the six year olds, Does anybody know where God lives? And finally, little Tommy raises his hand, and she's a little surprised. So she says, Tommy, where does God live? And Tommy says, God lives in our bathroom. And she's even more surprised, and she says, well, how do you know that? And he says, every morning, my mother stands in front of the bathroom door, and she hollers, oh, God, are you still in there? <laughs> <laughs> the, the other... <laughs> The other stuff I've got, uh, somewhere around the same time, I read in the New, York, the New Yorker a review of a book of little stories <coughs> called Little Willie. I don't know if any of you re ever remember that, but there are all kinds of horrible things that Little Willie does. Like Little Willie, full of gore, nailed his sister to the door. Mother said with humor quaint, Willie dear, don't spoil the paint. <laughs> and one more. <laughs> Will fell down the elevator, wasn't found till six days later. All the neighbors said, gee whiz, what a spoiled child Willie is. Oh. <laughs> uh, you got one? Come on. Musical? Of course, come on. We'll take any kind. <laughs> well, do you know why Johann Sebastian Bach could not play his organ? Why? It was Baroque. Oh. <laughs> and do you know why Mozart it. killed his chickens? What was that again? Because they said, Bach, 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 Bach. <laughs> And do you know how to tell when a bagpipe's out of tune? Somebody's playing it. <laughs> and and why, do, why do Highlanders like to march while they play their pipes? Why? A moving target is harder to hit. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> John, another one? <laughs> Am I part of this again? No. Okay. Somebody else? Okay. <laughs> told me one. Uh, this joke comes courtesy of the Opera Committee. And you may have heard me tell it before. Uh, two hobos were walking down uh, the riverbank and they heard this wonderful music and one hobo trying to impress the other said, Ah, that's the quartet from Rigoletto. 
You know, he says, oh, no, it isn't. That's the sextet from Lucia. The quartet from Ligaretto. The sextet from Lucia. And they argued back and forth. And finally, someone said, look up there at the building. There's a sign on the door. We can go and find out what it is. He so he went up, and he came back, and he said, we're both wrong. It's the refrain from spitting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. He said, um, oh, I, I, uh, this, this lady was having her, uh, her portrait painting, painted it. And uh, everything was going fine. And the picture, uh, and the woman asked the painter, "Do you have any paint left?" He says, "Oh, I got a lot of paint." Well, he says, "She says, when you finish the painting, I want you to put a necklace on, on around my neck. I want you to put r ruby and diamond rings on my fingers, and bracelets up and down my arms." Uh, but the, the painter says, but ma'am, you're really not that wealthy. Why are you doing it? So he, she says, well, I'm not getting along too well with my husband. And, if, and, and he's going out with other women. And if I go, if I leave this earth before him, I want his girlfriend or new wife to go crazy looking for all the jewelry. <laughs> 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 you got much Come on, John. Come on, we're getting warmed up. <laughs> this is the story of the New York chorus girl and the window washer. A chorus girl comes home, and of course these New York chorus girls really think there's something, and she sees a window washer washing the windows, just scrubbing away. She says, I think I'm going to have a little fun with this guy. So she takes off her shoes and just lets her socks float down. And there's the window washer. He's just washing the windows, paying no never mind. She takes off her blouse. The window washer's just washing the windows, paying no never mind. She slips out of her slacks. The window washer, just washing the windows, paying on never mind. Well, she's getting a little perturbed now. She unhooks her bra, lets it, flows it up in the air, it floats down. The window washer's just washing the windows, paying on never mind. She slips out of her undies. The window washers. The, the window washers just washing the windows, paying on never mind. Now she's really mad. Okay. She dances around all together. <laughs> the window washers just washing the windows, paying on never mind. What's the matter, lady? Ain't you ever seen a window washer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, um, this happened in a in a uh, in a little in a little church in a little town. The uh, this Sunday, the pastor says, "Today, we're going to honor uh, Mabel. She's been here for many many years." And we thought we would honor her today. She will have the honor of choosing three hymns. Fine. So he gives the sermon, and the choir is getting ready. And he says, young, la young lady, we will now choose the three hymns. So she gets up. She says, I choose him, him, and him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
I'll, I'll, re I'll repeat my performance later if you want. <laughs> I didn't think you got one. <laughs> This is an immigration story. Many of us, practically everybody in this room, I suppose, had a parent, a grandparent, a great-grandparent who came over to this country for a better life. Has everyone here fit into that category? Okay. Raise your hand if you've had someone. Well. This is a story of not an Italian man, not an Irish, not a Swedish, not a French, but a man from Russia, where my grandparents came from. He comes up to the officer, who's probably been working a 16-hour day and is grumpy. What's your name? And the man says, Rosa Shivsky. And the officer didn't know how to spell it, so he wrote down Rosen. So many people had their name changed when they came to this country by the officer. Now, there's one man who came from Russia. He was so scared that when he came up, they said, what's your name? And he shook his head, ich vergessen, which means I forgot. So the officer wrote down Ferguson, the first Jewish Ferguson in the US. <laughs> that's that's the same uh, that's the same kind of that I've heard. Instead of Ferguson, the uh, customs agent uh, asked what's your name and he says Yankele. Well Yankele in Yiddish is Jack or Jerry. So there's another Jewish man with the name of John Kelly. <laughs> uh, um, oh, uh, this um, this this government worker uh, uh, registered at this hotel, and he's and he's with a sort of a secretive. Uh, government job, and wherever he goes, he, so he looks. He he looks behind the curtains. He looks under the chairs. He looks under the bed. He looks between the mattress and spring. He checks over the place, and he just had a bad feeling about this room that he's staying in. This happened to be in Washington D.C. So he's looking. And he lifts, he lifts up the carpet, and there are a series of nuts and bolts. Aha! Uh -huh. He takes out his, he had some tools, and he, un, and he unscrews all the nuts and bolts. Fine. The next morning, he, he li he's leaving, goes up to the desk clerk, and the desk clerk says, did you enjoy? Your night, he says. Oh, very, very much so. He says, "You didn't hear the, you didn't hear the commotion in the apartment beneath you." He says, "No." He says, "A chandelier dropped on a man's head." <laughs> I'll explain it to you later. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, oh. Uh, this uh, this woman, this mother is having a conversation with her daughter, and the mother isn't too well, and she's complaining to her to her daughter that you don't visit with me very often. Well, uh, they're talking back and forth, and the mother says, "When I leave this earth." I want you to take my ashes and sprinkle them over Cole's department store. Why, mother? Why? She says, you visit Cole's more often than you visit me. 
<laughs> I hear an echo. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, no, no. This um, this very lovely elderly lady was ninety years old and had just been married for the fourth time. In a newspaper interview for the Wisconsin State Journal, the lady was asked for some details. What were the occupations of your husbands? was the question. First, she responded, I married a banker. Next, it was a circus manager, then a preacher. Finally, I married a funeral director. Really exclaimed the interview, a banker, a circus manager, a preacher, and a funeral director? It's simple, the lady explained. One for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. <laughs> oh. Oh. Here's a political joke. This goes way back. Al Gore and Bill and Hillary Clinton go to heaven. I know that, that this is just the first part of the joke. Look, don't laugh yet. God addresses Al first. Al, what do you believe in? Al replies, well, I believe I won that election, but that it was your will that I did not serve, and I've come to understand that. God thinks for a second and says, okay, very good, come and sit at my left. God then addresses Bill. Bill, what do you believe in? Bill replies, I believe in forgiveness. I've sinned but I've never held a grudge against my fellow man, and I hope no grudges are held against me. God thinks for a second and says, you are forgiven. My son, come and sit at my right. Then God addresses Hillary. Hillary, what do you believe in? I believe you're in my chair. <laughs> 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 oh, <okay. laughs> a man and his wife were having some problems at home and were giving each other the silent treatment. The next week, the man had an important appointment and had to be at the airport on time. Not wanting to be the first to break the silence, he finally wrote a note on a piece of paper. Please wake me at 5 a.m. The next morning, the man woke up only to discover that it was 9 a.m. and that he had missed his flight. Furious, he was about to go and see why his wife hadn't awakened him when he, when he noticed a piece of paper on the bed. It said, it's 5 a.m., wake up. <laughs> yeah. And here, a, um, this had an... A Census Bureau was conducting an actuarial survey in the Lower East Side of New York. He comes, to, he comes to this door, knocks on the door. There's this nice little Jewish 80-year-old man. The man is asked, you've lived here for many years. What is the death rate here in this area? The man thinks for a moment and replies, well, in my own opinion, don't hold me to this, I'm pretty sure it's one to a person. <laughs> okay. um, oh, I got a million. What time is it? You want to go a little bit over? It's 8 o'clock. You got another one? Okay, come on. You're going to wear out a path. <laughs> There was a man who was worried about how his son was going to grow up, so he made a test. He was going to put some money on the table, some liquor in a jar, and a Bible, and said, okay, if he picks up the money, he's going to be a rich man. If he picks up the Bible, he's going to become a rabbi. And if he picks up the other one, 
uh, what's that? A whiskey. That's right. No coaching from the audience, okay. please. So the guy <laughs> hides behind a curtain and sees what happens. So the young man comes up and he sees all that stuff on the table and he picks up the Bible, tucks it under his arm, takes the uh, whiskey and drinks it and takes the third thing, the liquor, and takes a drink. And the father says, oh my God, he's going to become an Irish priest. <laughs> well, uh, a rabbi and a priest discovered that they were living on the same block. So they decided uh, to buy an automobile together. And uh, while you know, the rabbi doesn't use the car at the end of the week on Friday and Saturday. So this one morning, he, the rabbi comes out and he sees the priest is uh, sprinkling water on the automobile. The rabbi comes over and says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm baptizing the car. So the rabbi thinks for a moment. He runs back into his home. He comes out with a saw and he cuts off part of the tail, pipe. All right, think about that. Come on. What do young Jewish men get as babies? <laughs> hey, see, <laughs> let's go on. <clears throat> a senior citizen to his, a senior citizen said to his 80-year-old buddy, "So I hear you're getting married." "Yep." "Do I know her?" "Nope." This woman, is she good looking? Not really. Is she a good cook? Nah, she can't cook too well. Does she have lots of money? No, nope. poor as a church mouse. Well then, is she good in bed? I don't know. Why in the world do you want to marry her then? Be because she can still drive after dark. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. I recently picked up a new primary care physician. After two visits and exhaustive lab tests, he said I was doing fairly well for my age. A little concerned about the comment, I couldn't resist asking him, do you think I'll live to be 80? He asked, do you smoke? tobacco or drink beer or wine? Oh no, I replied. I'm not doing drugs either. And then he asked, do you eat ribeye steaks and barbecued ribs? I said no. My, others, my other doctor said that all red meat is very, is very unhealthy. Do you spend a lot of time in the sun? like playing golf, sailing, hiking, or bicycling? No, I don't, I said. He asked, do you gamble, drive fast cars, or have a lot of sex? No, I said, I don't do any of those things. He looked at me and said, then why do you want to live to be 80? <laughs> okay. This is titled, Listen to Your Doctor, another one. Morris, an 82-year-old man, went to the doctor to get a physical. A few days later, the doctor saw Morris walking down the street with a gorgeous young woman in his arm. A couple of days later, the doctor spoke to Morris and said, you're really doing great, aren't you? Morris replied, just doing what you said, doc. Get a hot mama and be cheerful. The doctor says, I didn't say that. I said, you've got a heart murmur. Be careful. <laughs> oh, boy. Huh? You got another one? <laughs> A 
This uh, couple spent the winter in Florida every year. And uh, they would spell each other driving home. They made it home, going straight through. Finally, the husband said to the wife, how dumb can you get? We have really beaten ourselves up driving all the way home, being tired for two days. Why don't we stop when we're about 100 miles away, get home in the morning, we'll be fresh, we can meet all our friends and really enjoy it. She said, that's a great idea. So they did, they, and they stopped 100 miles away, 150 miles away from home, and they were so tired, they went right to bed. When they got up the next morning, they had all their suitcases with them at the desk. They were handed a bill for $300. And he pushed it back to the desk clerk again. He said, this is not our bill. It's, we were in room 130. He said, no, that's your bill. Push it back out again. 300 for eight hours of sleep? Does that sound reasonable to you? He said, well, it sounds reasonable when you think of all the things that went along with it. We had a great big recreation area, weightlifting. You could have had a free massage. There was a little pitch and butt court. There's a Las Vegas lounge with acts coming through from New York. And every time he named something, they'd both say, we didn't use any of that. We didn't use any of that. And he would always say, well, you could have. It was here, and it was part of it. You could have. So finally, he rang for the manager. The manager came out and said the same thing. It's definitely $300. So the fella put down his suitcase over the shoulder bag, whips out his checkbook, and he writes out a check, hands it to the desk clerk, and he said to her, come on, honey, let's go. Wait a minute, sir. This check is only for $100. That room was $300. He said, no, I'm charging you 200 bucks for sleeping with my wife. The desk clerk said, I never slept with your wife. Well, you could have. She was here. <laughs> it's a little after eight. Shall we continue on some more? <laughs> Sai, you got another one? Okay. A few more, and then we'll, we'll call it a day rather than a night. Okay. Here you go. Sure, remember back in the 1960s when uh, uh, Nikita Khrushchev and Mrs. Khrushchev visited the United States. Well, this is one I mentioned to a men's group of a Greek Orthodox Church they asked me to speak one time. Yeah. Uh, Put it uh, by your mouth. Excuse me. Put it by your mouth, the microphone. Here. Okay. Uh, a very noted uh, professor of history was asked, what would have happened, how do you think history would have been different when Kennedy had not been assassinated and Nikita Khrushchev had been the one assassinated? So the professor thought for a while and he said, you know, there are so many variables, it's, it's really impossible to say what differences in history would have appeared from that time. But one thing is certain, Aristotle Onassis would not have married Mrs. Khrushchev. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. A, distra a distraught senior citizen phones her doctor's office. Is it true, she wanted to know, that the medication you prescribe has to be taken for the rest of my life? Yes, I'm afraid so, the doctor told her. There was a moment of silence before the senior lady replied. I'm wondering then, how serious is my condition because this prescription is marked no refills? <laughs> Here. Long ago when men cursed and beat the ground with sticks, it was called witchcraft. Today, it's called golf. <laughs> yeah, well, here. Oh, here's the cute one. 
An elderly man in Denver calls his son in Los Angeles and says, I hate to ruin your day, but I have to tell you that your mother and I are divorcing. 45 years of misery is enough. Dad, what are you talking about? The son screams. We can't stand the sight of each other any longer, the old man says. We're sick and tired of each other, and I'm sick of talking about this. So you can call your sister in Atlanta and tell her, and he hangs up. Frantic, the son calls his sister, who explodes on the phone. Like heck, they're getting divorced. She shouts, I'll take care of this. She calls home and screams at her dead, you are not getting divorced. Don't do a thing until I get there. I'm calling my brother back and we'll be both uh, be back, we'll be both at your house tomorrow. Until then, don't do a thing. Do you hear me? And hangs up. The old man hangs up his phone and turns to his wife. Okay, he says. They're coming for Thanksgiving and paying their own fares. Now, what do we tell them about Christmas? <laughs> I'm enjoying my own jokes. I'm not young. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two elderly ladies meet at the drugstore after not seeing one another for some time. After inquiring about each other's health, one asks how the other was doing. Oh, Harold died last week. He went out to the garden to dig up a potato for dinner, had a heart attack, and dropped down dead right there in the middle of the vegetable patch. Oh, dear, I'm very sorry, replied her friend. What did you do? Opened up a can of beans. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like my body has gotten, oh, this should, we all know this. I feel like my body has gotten totally out of shape. So I got my doctor's permission to join a fitness club and start exercising. I decided to take an aerobic, an aerobic class for seniors. I bent, twisted, gyrated, jumped up and down, and perspired for an hour. But by the time I got my leotards on, the class was over. <laughs> okay, let's see. See what, see what else I got. <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, here you go. <laughs> the wife is visiting her husband, and her husband says, Oh dear, I know I'm not gonna last too long and you've been good to me. I'm gonna leave you a billion dollars and you know the estate in Connecticut? You're gonna get that too. And you know the painting, that, that beautiful painting we have that we paid several hundred thousand dollars for, you're gonna get that too. And in and, and, and the condo on Fifth Avenue overlooking Central Park, you're gonna get that too. Oh dear, you're so good to me. Is there anything I could do for you? Yes, please step off my oxygen cord. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point? Please step, please step off my oxygen cord. <laughs> okay, here. I think one or two more. Okay, or you want to go on? <laughs> here, when when all the new technology regarding fertility recently, a 65-year-old woman was able to give birth. When she was discharged from the hospital and went home, her relatives came to visit. May we see the new baby, one asked. Not yet, said the mother. I'll make coffee and we can come and visit for a while first. 30 minutes had passed and another relative asked, may we see the new baby now? No, not yet, said the mother. Another few minutes had elapsed, they asked again. May we see the baby now? 
No, not yet, replied the mother. Growing very impatient, they asked, Well, when can we see the baby? And she yells out, When he cries, she told him, What do you mean when he cries? Why do you have to wait until he cries? Because I forgot where I put him. <laughs> after, after 50 years of marriage, the couple was sitting at the dinner table, and the wife said to her husband, after all these years of marriage, I know that you are tried and true. And he replied, what did you say? She said in a louder voice, after all these years of marriage, I have learned that you are tried and true. He said, speak louder. She said in a louder voice, after all these years of marriage, I have learned that you are tried and true. He replied, he replied loudly, well, I'm tired of you too. <laughs> okay. here's, a, here, here's something. Here. Uh, you might be old if everything hurts, and what doesn't hurt doesn't work anyway. The gleam in your eyes are from the sun hitting your bifocals. You feel like you really hung one on the night before, and you were in bed asleep by eight. You get winded playing chess. Your children begin to look middle-aged. You join a health club and don't go. You begin to outlive enthusiasm. Your mind makes contracts your body can't meet. You know all the answers, but nobody asks the questions. And so, folks, one last thing. I'll give you a little ditty. When you come to the end of a lollipop and there's nothing left to lick, your heart goes down with an awful thump when there's nothing left to lick. Thank you one and all. It was, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Time for bed. Thank you. Thank you. Shall, shall we do this again someday? <laughs> How much better can they get? <laughs> oh, here you are. <laughs> okay, that's it.